Today, um, I am very privileged to be joined by Professor Dr. Uh, Anna Goldenberg. Um, she is an incredible, incredible scholar and researcher, runs her own lab, and I don't know how she finds time to be part of the Vector Institute, uh, TCARM, which is the Timothy Center for Artificial Intelligence Research, um, and uh, education in medicine, um, and works at Sick Kids, and at the same time somehow has become the new director of a program that's launching uh, uh, that is going to somehow in her spare time uh, teach students how to apply healthcare uh, how research and AI to research and then to healthcare delivery. And um, so I'd like to welcome uh, um, Anna, if I may call you Anna. Um, sure. Uh, hi. Um, thank you for this funny introduction. Uh, I swear this is not all random and completely orthogonal. It all makes sense together, and that's the only way it's possible. Um, just to the point of introduction outside of all of these titles, I actually um, um, have been advising students, uh, mostly in the computer science side, but um, a lot of the students, uh, medical students as well, in sort of crafting the path of how they would be studying and deploying and developing AI in, uh, for healthcare before this program existed. And so when uh, the Department of Computer Science and uh, LMP came and said, we really want um, you know, to, to, to develop such a program, it was just a perfect opportunity to scale you know, put, put uh, the sort of ad hoc programs that we've been uh, trying to put together and scale uh, this endeavor to make sure that, you know, AI can be deployed uh, over time in a safe and responsible manner across uh, uh, Canada and, and the world with oh. our students as leaders, of course. Okay. So <laughs> wow. uh, that's the plan. Okay, that, that it's a big plan, but um, if you don't mind, Anna, I, I have to admit something, um, something probably very horrible, um, and um, probably that um, uh, I shouldn't admit to you. Um, I don't know what AI is, um, or at I least see. I don't understand it, because... Uh, People have been talking about AI since that movie by Spielberg. I'm uh, way back when. Um, and then I had a colleague that talked about AI is dead. And we talk about artificial life now um, and, and neural networks and mimicking things. And now we're back to AI after many decades. So what is AI? So... I think to most people who actually work in the field, in the field of artificial intelligence, we think of it as um, basically mathematical modeling of data. Machine learning um, is the big component of artificial intelligence. So it's not, it's not mystery, it's not um, you know, magic. Um, you can sprinkle it on top of things. It's really mathematical modeling and statistical modeling, um, which oftentimes works with the data that exists. Sometimes it can generate data. This, these days, it's uh, uh, ChatGPT, for example, can generate uh, data uh, as a response to requests that you provide. Uh, you can generate the images. So, the, um, uh, but as a point of, of reference, it takes something that exists um, in the world that we have created and tries to learn the patterns from it with okay. the various tasks as goals. You've already lost me because, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so how is it that a mathematical statistical, uh, algorithm, uh, talks to us? 
<laughs> so AI, you said it's so it's math, it's it's a formula. So what it, why is it any different than what I did in calculus? Um why well, it's just it's just a bit more complex. It's not it's not something that you never learned. Uh, it's just a lot more complex based on the foundational uh, tools that we all learn in math. Um, and um, the idea is that it um, basically synthesizes it existing parts of the corpus. I, I assume you mean chat GPT. Um, <laughs> because there are not not <laughs> there are not so many so many AI uh, algorithms that are now in the public view that talk to us as chat gpt does uh, right well, so well ac actually you'd be surprised in the last several weeks there have been several health related chat bots that have been launched um there have been uh, image searches like dolly and dolly 2 um yeah. so the, there this is not going away anytime soon so okay I have to ask you, and and maybe this is what I'm also trying to understand. Um, is AI going to take over the world? <laughs> it's a funny thing. Um, not anytime soon, I would say. Okay. Um, so uh, I think people in the AI field um, are aware of how hard it's been to actually create methods that generalize from existing data. So the reason why, for example, we are doing so well in large language models um, is because we have a lot of uh, texts written that we can learn from. Um, in medical data, for example, in healthcare, we are fairly poor, data poor. So it seems like it's a lot of data, but that's because we've been thinking about it and sort of processing it manually to some extent. Um, uh, but the reality is, is that for any specific medical question, we are fairly data poor. And so this uh, generates the, the need for new methodology in healthcare, uh, methods that are more specific uh, because the tasks are very different, also because we don't really understand, right? Some of the benefits of human intuition is that we can evaluate uh, some of the large language models, uh, you know, with our uh, common sense. We cannot do that in a lot of the healthcare uh, applications that requires an expert. So I, I think we are not anywhere close to AI taking over the world. I think by the time it is so incredibly amazing that we um, just can't compete with it as humans, it should for sure take over some tasks so that we can dedicate our time to better um, to better things, but nowhere close. And especially in healthcare, there's still a lot of struggles. I so can tell I... you that the one thing I just want to want to say that. In specifically in, in the medical field, uh, we're talking about uh, streaming data like time series, right? Uh, uh, accumulating patient records over time and uh, something happens or a trajectory of disease, et cetera, et cetera. You can look at the large models out there and they're not in time series space. So this is something that my lab is working on. Um, this is something that the AI field is, is lacking in actually. Yeah, I've heard it to, referred to as hospitals are data lakes, um, and you only see them at, at a particular time, but then they flow out and nobody's been tracking the other end. Um, a little bit of data swamps, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> okay, maybe that's a better one. I, I, because I the access is hard and... Yeah, yeah and, and, and tracking and over time. And the quality is poor. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've seen some clinicians you know write their notes <laughs> um it, it's hard to understand as a human um i do want to i i want to push on this point a little bit more because i think at the crux of everything that you are talking about is an understanding that i i don't have and i think most people don't have because it seems to me um when we're talking about ai 
and I was being a little tongue in cheek with Skynet taking over the world. We think of AI as artificial intelligence and intelligence is not a single, in, at least in my thinking about it, is not a single plane of existence. It actually different kinds of intelligences exist. And I think what makes us, maybe what makes us at least a little different so far is that we process things with different intelligences simultaneously and almost like making connections where we don't see it. So how is artificial intelligence, artif is it really intelligent? So I think um, there has to be a bit of a um, distinction. Uh, what you are talking about is AGI, which is the, the generalized uh, intel a artificial generalized intelligence versus narrow sense intelligence, which is what I was talking about mostly, and that's what exists. Narrow sense intelligence exists, and that means that um, we've created methods for uh, to solve specific tasks, and in some cases, it does uh, particularly well, uh, really, really well. Um, in terms of generalized intelligence, people are working on it uh, for sure. But so far, it's been, uh, it, it, I would personally say it doesn't exist, but uh, it again depends on the definition. So some people who are working on it may say that it does exist. Um, I have to say that at some point it becomes a philosophical discussion. Um, and when I was uh, at the neuroscience uh, conference in Japan, at the CIFRA meeting in Japan, the 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 Japanese uh, scientists have defined it as sort of the ability to reason and work on objects in particular cases in robotics. And so since robots can learn to manipulate real life objects, they call it uh, cognition or intelligence, which we in the field of machine learning might not. And so I think this is, this. I don't know if this is interesting to the audience, but there are various levels of discussions about uh, this. And uh, I think what's practical and what exists right now uh, already is the narrow sense intelligence. Yeah. So so I, I particularly wanted to, to, dis, to challenge or to discuss that point um, because um, it is very germane to the discussion and understanding um, of uh, what is artificial intelligence and what are their potential uses and how do we understand it for research and for application. So what I just heard you say in, in my non-computer science brain um, is that there are two main schools that are working on two different kinds of intelligence. The broad, uh, which is general purpose intelligence, which ideally would be something that could solve problems or learn any from problem. Any, any problem. problem. And so that, in theory, I don't want to compare it to human beings necessarily, but that's what we kind of think of as intelligence, that it's not just you're presented one narrow problem, but if you're really intelligent, you can actually take that understanding and apply it in a different domain entirely. So, so what you're saying is that kind of Skynet, we're gonna, I'm a, a, a conscious entity has yet to be demonstrated um, by scientists. There, yes, uh, people are working on it. There are several AGI companies and some people in the field are saying that they should be stopped. Uh, I think this is all innovation and it's all our creation and it's uh, the project as long as we have uh, rules and regulations about it being used for good. Um, this is something that I think uh, should continue because it has a great potential to help us with the tasks we don't want to do. Mm -hmm. So then uh, this actually this actually then puts to the second point, 
And what we are looking at, and when we usually talk about AI in research or healthcare research and AI in application for healthcare delivery, we're actually talking about a specific subset of, for the layman, AI, which is the narrow AI. And narrow that sense, is, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And so this narrow sense, I think, is it's important to make that distinction because you said it, and if, if I understood correctly, it is a set of algorithms that learn from data to solve very narrow or specific problems. Correct. So, yeah. And the problems can be very different right mm -hmm. the problems can be very very different so it may be a problem to di diagnose uh, a patient right it just takes somebody said i still don't understand how it works and so how it works it would be we've seen and patients before these are their characteristics every time these characteristics um you know have this this pattern it seems that the patient has this diagnosis and so basically we infer probabilistically usually we probabilistically infer um, the probability of a diagnosis given the patient's data what are the set of these characteristics that we observed about the patients and then we can um, have the this mapping essentially to functions a mathematical function it's complex in some cases and it's more simpler in others but uh, to to generate this diagnosis based on the input data about the patient the new patient for example so that's a simple way in which uh, uh, ai is being used and developed that's a narrow sense ai for a specific diagnosis but there are other types of ai right so for example um, there's something called reinforcement learning, and that's a way to, um, to generate optimal policies. Uh, this is, is uh, one of the tasks. And so, um, for example, one of the things you could do uh, with this type of tool is to figure out when to optimally test patients uh, to, de to detect their deterioration over time. So, uh, again, uh, this is a, a bit of a different algorithm, and you have to um, sort of probe um, and give it actions and try these actions and then learn from the actions and the outcomes that uh, these actions result in. So the test in this particular case. So there are, there are a variety, a great variety of the types of tasks uh, that uh, uh, are all under the big umbrella of machine learning and AI. Okay, so just before I get to some of uh, the people that have raised their hands, because I want to give uh, trainees and people from the audience a chance to talk to you, um, I just want to close the loop on this because um, I, I still think for maybe I'm wrong, and if there are people in the audience are, if I'm beating a dead horse, tell me, but I want to close this loop because I think the general population may not have or appreciate the subtlety. So, um, what I'm hearing you say is one of these narrow AIs can't just decide, oh, today I'm going to solve a different problem. No, can't. So these are applications that are very specific and contextual. And so chat GPT cannot generate images. Um, chat gpt can't do other kinds of assessment outside of language processing and concordances so not yet <laughs> not yet no but but the second it does then it becomes this general sort of ai where it can actually make connections between Is that i think it depends actually depends on how it does it because you can fold multiple algorithms under one umbrella and say um we can now do everything but um the next question if it's a different question than the one in the set of algorithms that you ask it might not be able to do right the idea of generalized ai is that it can work on new questions that it was never asked to learn that uh literally creating images when it has never seen a single image right so um this there is um um the, the, there is a, a 
a narrow sense, right? You can put a whole bunch of algorithms together and call it a more generalized AI, but it's not mm -hmm. going to be generalized enough unless it really can step out of the box and say, I will solve this a completely different question now. So in a sense, that's sort of kind of what I was alluding to that was discussed as artificial life in um, MIT a number of decades back. I don't think it's around as a wor word, but the idea was to create bots or programs or algorithms that would learn from their environment and interacting with their environment and become evolve and become more complex. So um, this happens. This this actually exists. They don't necessarily, but they don't necessarily generate images, right? So OpenAI has released, I think it was called a playground, where uh, which was a tool for uh, robots to learn from scratch to do all kinds of tasks. And this this specifically exists where they were never taught anything, and just by manipulating objects and failing, they were learning to ultimately perform certain tasks. And what I'm understanding, if excuse is that extended is potentially one flavor of the holy grail of generalized AI. It's, it's closer. Yeah. It, it, it depends, I guess, how far the evolution goes, but I know that there are some barriers that various yeah. people have encountered. Um, okay, so so the reason I wanted to harp on that is because I wanted to make the point that at this day, stage, at least, maybe for the next six months or maybe less, um, the narrow AI applications are what we are looking at and discussing in healthcare. So it is not- I would say the next- five years at least <laughs> okay so well, but you never know <laughs> uh, oh five years is a better window i will tell you <laughs> it's a more comforting window so in five years then this is what we're looking at they're not going to replace doctors in five years at least i don't think there anybody is talking about replacing doctors i think the idea is that it will be another helpful tool right i mean the field of radiology has been helped tremendously by the machines developed by the physicists right in terms of imaging and and um, i feel like the fields of medicine that have incorporated technology have done very well uh, they didn't go away they just um evolved to work with this technology and to be able to uh, perform more complex tasks. And I think that's what's gonna happen with AI in general, AI and cooperation in general. I think people, what, right. what, what, what the Royal Society of uh, Physicians and Surgeons said is that, I think it was in that report saying that, uh, that AI will not replace uh, uh, physicians or uh, uh, clinicians, uh, but clinicians who work with AI will replace clinicians who don't. I think that was the... That's the, actually a really good way of putting it. Um, but you're right. I mean, signal processing has come such a long way in the last two decades. Um, and for radiology in particular, it's there's there's this huge potential for, for understanding data. If I may, I'm going to do a little bit of self-indulgence for the TRP, the Translational Research Program, um, because we are also recruiting still, and we want these kinds of people and thinkers, um, just as Anna's program is recruiting clinicians, uh, MDs interested in this, I believe, still. Um, and I welcome any of you to reach out to um, uh, the LMP website uh, to find more about this, both programs, um, and to find out what you might need uh, to apply to either one of them, um, and uh, refer to people you know in your networks, um, recommend the curious innovators. But I'm going to reply to Jamie in a slightly different uh, I see you had your hand up first. Um, What's your question? Yeah, um, I just wanted to go back to the point you're making about uh, like a, a more narrow AI system um, predicting and diagnosis for a patient. And then could you just speak for a minute on how or like mitigation strategies to avoid either 
race or gender-based bias in algorithms, if it's pulling from data that we've been accumulating in a potentially biased way. Um, and then also in a similar vein, I guess, um, the kind of age old, if you hear hoof beats, you think horses, not zebras, you know, how is it going to be good enough, I guess, to catch rarer diseases maybe, and just kind of how that all gets folded in, in terms of um, if it can continue maybe down the wrong path, if it's learning off of uh, typical data, which I guess, so humans a, as well, but <laughs> yeah. That's that's a, that's a, a a great question, and it's a question that everybody, it's on everybody's minds uh, who is working in AI, right? How do we create tools that are less biased, um, especially than the data that uh, it's learning uh, they are learning from? And there is a whole subfield that's called the fair AI, uh, which tries to address this. And there are many ways, there are many strategies, including. Um, just testing on subgroups how it performs and um trying and also saying our labels are noisy sort of sort of the outcomes are noisy and incorporating that noise into the algorithm saying we are not sure that this label is correct so uh, we can examine in the end um it's going to be really hard to evaluate the quality of the tool if all the labels are noisy, right? You have to have a, a panel of experts to say, yes, this tool is actually better than what it has learned from. Um, so there's a large, large um, effort in terms of uh, annotating, uh, right? And trying to sort of incorporate clinicians into all the AI development tools to, to make sure that the whatever um, the, the uh, AI uh, outcome is produced that it makes sense in a, in a sort of the, the real setting. And we actually have been saying that even if there is no problem with fairness, if the tool is actually good, it will never be right, right? So if we are predicting that something is about to happen and we predict it well enough and in time, then it can be prevented. The critical event can be pre prevented, for example. So you will never get uh, the actual critical event that what you would use as a label to prove that the system was right. So I feel like it's an evolving collaboration between uh, AI experts and clinicians. And that's the whole point of this program is to say, we need both. We really need both. We need people who know, understand and can build AI and people who know, understand, and can build the actual expert processes in medicine um, to come together to be able to generate, uh, you know, tools that that are useful in practice. Uh, but so I, you are absolutely right. Data is most of the time is absolutely horrendous. It's very biased, and uh, there are many, many, many ways to to deal with it. Um, yeah. So, so say, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joseph. Uh, sorry about that. So I think Anna, this is an um, we're beginning an excellent transition uh, right now from what is happening to what is your, what is the program or what is the future of how people are going to work. I know that a number of people in the audience are um, uh, well, at least a handful that I can see are with the translational research program, uh, which is supposed to uh, work with students to be able to translate between domains like computer science and and um, medical delivery um, and work with perhaps your students to be able to design some of these uh, future um, research as well as future delivery models um, but it's it take I think the the point that you said that is very important, is that it's understanding both sides. I remember uh, I was doing, when I was doing my PhD, um, I had somebody ask me, well, what happens if these algorithms become 100%? And I wanted to tell somebody, you can't, that's just impossible. You don't understand the algorithm, what's going on here, because there it will never reach 100%. It's always a probability trade-off based on, 
false positives, false negatives, whatever. Um, but I don't think the majority of people understand that. Um, so it takes a special kind of grouping or pairing or collaboration of people who can both understand the way that these algorithms work and the way that, frankly, medicine works. Um, I think so I there is, yeah, there is an important point. So the I was part of this, the working group for the society, uh, uh, the Royal Society of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada and the report that was written. And the point, uh, one of the questions that was asked, what are the core competencies that one needs to be able to do this well? And I think it's one of the questions in the chat. And um, statistics is a core competency that one needs, sort of understanding probability. My understanding is that it's part of medical training right now, and that people might not realize the importance of it, but the importance will grow as we use more and more sort of algorithmic tools to help us make decisions. Um, and uh, that's, it's uh, not, I would say it's not necessary to understand exactly how the algorithm works and how it makes the decision because it's a whole bunch of mathematical functions put together, right? Just to make it a highly complex nonlinear uh, function. But um, what is important, what people have to be able to be comfortable with is knowing how to work with this tool. Right? What happens when um, you give certain parameters or you give certain uh, uh, inputs to the tool, how it's likely to react? And that will help to um, incorporate the tool into the daily practice much easier. So Jamie, um, I think you're the author of the uh, question in, in, uh, in question. So do you want to ask your question? Um, I, I can ask a slightly different question because that one's already in the chat. Um, my question is, do you think we're maybe conflating the complexity of any particular AI tool with the impact of that tool? And I'll, I'll sort of expand on that by when you said, you know, we got to be careful to, you know, not say that, like, this is not going to be replacing doctors, but in some ways it is already. I mean, people are using chat GPT to ask medical questions about their own health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's replacing teachers in some way by asking chat GPT to write essays and teach them about history concepts and math concepts and whatever. And so maybe the tool itself is not a doctor, but the people using it are treating it as such. And so I was wondering if you could speak on the sort of uh, ethical implications of of these tools that are being developed, and perhaps maybe not so much with the, the narrow scope ones, but uh, with with applications like ChatGPT, where they they obviously aren't doctors; they're probability models that generate language output. But in some ways, they're smart enough for people to believe that they can provide decent medical advice. And so, I think we got to be careful to not say that doctors aren't going to be replaced, because in some ways, they are. Um. I mean, I think in, in some way, it's synthesizing knowledge that already exists, ChatGPT is. And this knowledge has existed long before computers and ChatGPT, right? There were books, always there were books, and there were people who would go to the books as opposed to go to the doctor, or they would um, you know, learn and, and read. And this a whole question of sort of, what is the value of education and how far you can you can take it? Um, I don't think that people who um, uh, are asking ChatGPT to answer their uh, clinical questions will actually trust it enough with a very serious uh, illness or very serious drama. There is another issue um, uh, that, um, well, I mean. I think, I think this can become a philosophical debate, um, but I don't think, I mean, WebMD has existed and, and people would look up WebMD for the last, what, 10 years or more and uh, say, I have these symptoms, what do I have? And WebMD would come up and say, you have one of these 300 different things. Um, and it was highly frustrating. And I think, my sense is that there are 
we live in a world that is constantly transforming. It's not like medicine 30 years ago, 40 years ago has, has been the same as it is now. It's transforming based on evidence. And so incorporating things like ChatGPT, incorporating things like, um, you know, wearable device information into uh, clinical understanding of what's happening with the patients, all of the things that are happening outside of the clinic that is currently not really being incorporated into clinical medicine might come to play and will be able to treat patients earlier and they will have a better quality of life. So I'm not saying that we are not, um, I, I don't think we are taking clinician and replacing with an AI tool. That's not happening right now. I think what's happening is this natural transformation as it's always been happening where we have new knowledge and we have technology and we are trying to incorporate this new technology into the discipline that has to keep growing and has to keep evolving i mean in my personal experience as a patient medicine has been more art than science and i feel like maybe this is one way that it will help uh, to make it more standardized, right? I mean, why do the, the clinicians give me different diagnosis depending on who I go and which hospital I'm uh, evaluated at? That, that shouldn't be, right? So, so I, think, I think we are trying to, to build tools that will help it to standardize to higher quality. I, I, I do not see a concern with a human being replaced. I see some of the uncertainty perhaps being helped by these tools. Um, if I may, I'm going to do a little bit of self-indulgence for the TRP, the Translational Research Program, um, because we are also recruiting still, and we want these kinds of people and thinkers, um, just as Anna's program is recruiting clinicians, uh, MDs interested in this, I believe, still. Um, and I welcome any of you to reach out to um, uh, the LMP website uh, to find more about this, both programs, um, and to find out what you might need uh, to apply to either one of them, um, and refer to people you know in your networks, um, recommend the curious innovators. But I'm going to reply to Jamie in a slightly different way. Um, that you had said basically that, um, you know, this now educators are being replaced because they can write, uh, chat GPT can write papers. Um, I actually think that that's the wrong question or the wrong perspective. It's not that education or educators are being replaced. Maybe the outdated modes of thinking about education as a industrial process of building step after step in order to assess to a minimum bar of 50% as a pass is coming to an end because the, um, the factory-based system of being able to just understand information uh, or read or carry out Taylorism or Ford-like processes is no longer good enough. And education that is based on memorization or based on um, putting together existing facts or documents can now, or storing them in your mind, can now be done much better by Google and many search engines and now chat GPT. But maybe perhaps what we're seeing is a transformation of an understanding of what is important in education and the demonstration and performance of competencies of solving complex tasks of creativity, of um, problem solving, that is right now not something that ChatGPT or any of these narrow focused algorithms can do. That's still for, for apparently for five years, uh, something that is relatively safe. Phil, you, you had your hand up. I want to comment on somebody's uh, point here, which is important okay. that 
chat GPT and other tools uh, are, not, are frequently not accurate and that you you have to keep prompting it to correct itself and that sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. What happens in questions that it doesn't know? So all of the outcomes like these have to be taken with a grain of salt. And that also transforms people's thinking and learning. They are trying to push the system to become better um, by which they learn. But I completely agree that uh, we are transforming uh, we are hoping that these tools will transform education into uh, sort of a critical thinking machine, which is what it should be, as opposed to memorizing certain rules, uh, which is not interesting or exciting for any student. 